Hello, everyone, and welcome into the debut of the NABC Academy uh, webinar series. I'm Eric Weberg, coming to you from the NABC office here in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, before we get going with our, our special guest today, we uh, would just first like to say that we're really excited to introduce this series to you, our members, and I uh, want to give you some real quick background on what our goals are uh, for this new webinar series. Um, first and foremost, we want this to be an educational resource for the members of the NABC and for really anyone in the coaching community. Uh, we developed this with you in mind. Uh, we also want to hear from you on suggestions for who you'd like to see us interview. Uh, what would you like to, to learn from this webinar? Um, we're, we're open to any ideas and welcome you tweeting ideas to us. You can always tweet us at NABC1927 or you can reach out to me directly uh, with suggestions. And lastly, we uh, want to uh, again encourage you that uh, to participate during today's webinar from wherever you're watching. If you have any questions that you would like to ask uh, our guest, again, you can tweet at us uh, at NABC1927, or you can use the hashtag NABC Academy, and uh, we'd be happy to pass along some of your questions during the webinar. So with that, I'm very honored to introduce our guest for today's webinar. He's the, the NCAA Senior Vice President of Basketball, Dan Gavitt. Uh, Dan really has deep roots in the game of basketball, and his role at the NCAA now includes oversight of both men's and women's basketball. So with that, Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, if you could just start by giving us some uh, personal background and some career background, and now explain what you do there in Indianapolis at the NCAA. Sure. Well, thanks, Eric. Great being with you, and thanks for giving me the opportunity. Uh, NABC is a big part of uh, my job here at the at the NCAA, and uh, was a former member of the NABC myself as an assistant basketball coach uh, many, many years ago. And so I um, love working with Jim Haney, Reggie Minton, the entire staff at the NABC. And I think it's a great idea. I uh, started my career uh, after college as an assistant basketball coach at Providence College. Worked for Rick Barnes for six years at Providence. Uh, started as a graduate assistant and moved up to part-time and actually finished my career as a restricted earnings coach. Um, I may be the only plaintiff that's ever gone to work at the NCAA. Um, we had some success in Providence, went to three NCAA tournaments, two NITs, and had the chance uh, to uh, play in and, and win the Big East tournament in 1994. Worked with some great guys at, at uh, Providence, aside from Rick Barnes as well, uh, other assistant coaches, including Larry Shiat, Fran Fraschella, Dennis Felton, Herb Sendek, all still very good friends. After leaving coaching in 1995, I started my own sports marketing business in Providence, did that for a few years. After that, I became the athletics director at Bryant College, a Division II school in Rhode Island and now a Division I institution of uh, Bryant University. I was there for six years. I was fortunate enough and smart enough, I guess, to hire Max Good as our head basketball coach, who uh, took Bryant to the Division II national championship game in Grand Forks, North Dakota in 2005, where we lost by just five points to Virginia Union, coached by Hall of Famer Dave Robbins, and had a great run uh, with Max and his team at Bryant. After Bryant, I went to work at the Big East Conference as the Associate Commissioner for Men's Basketball. I was the primary administrator at the Big East for seven years from 2005 to 2012. Uh, it was just at the time when the league had expanded to 16 teams with the addition of Louisville, Cincinnati, Marquette, Paul in South Florida. At the Big East, I oversaw Big East tournament operations, officiating, assisted in scheduling and relationships with our television partner at ESPN, uh, was the primary contact for coaches and administrators, conference liaison with the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Committee and staff, and gained an awful lot of experience with the NCAA tournament through the success of the teams at the Big East at the time. Over that seven-year time period, the Big East averaged an astonishing eight bids a year during that stretch, including one year in 2011 where the, the conference had 11 teams in the tournament, which was eventually won by UConn. Um, I started here at the NCAA in August of 2012, so it's been just over four years now. I started as the vice president of men's basketball championships, overseeing uh, a team and staff that manages the Division One, Division Two, II, and Division Three men's basketball championships, as well as the NIT. And this past December, I was promoted to senior vice president of basketball. And in my new role, I continue to oversee uh, those three men's championships, uh, NCAA championships, as well as the NIT, and now also the division, the three divisions of the women's basketball championships, along with my colleague Anuka Brown, vice president of women's basketball championships. 
I'm the primary liaison to the Division One Men's Basketball Committee, uh, which is the tournament committee, as well as the primary a primary primary liaison with the Men's Basketball Oversight Committee, the Division One Oversight Committee. And I manage our relationship with CBS and Turner Sports for the NCAA tournament. Oversee the national officiating program led by national coordinator officials J.D. Collins. Men's basketball playing rules, competition committee, and serve as kind of the primary contact and maintaining relationships with key partners in basketball, including the NBA, FIBA. I'm on the board of USA Basketball, representing the NCA, a board member of the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. And importantly, also, I serve as an ex officio member of the NABC board, uh, where I work very closely and regularly with Jim Haney. Actually, we speak on a, on a weekly basis, sometimes daily. Um, and, and, and also now in this new role, serve on President Mark Emmert's senior staff. So I have direct line communication to the president of the NCA and uh, for the benefit of working on men's basketball issues, uh, which I think really underscores the importance of the NCA of men's basketball and then ABC. So that, that's kind of a nutshell of my uh, career and, and uh, what's led me up to this point at the NCA. Well, great, Dan. Thanks for that background. And uh, like I said, you've got deep roots that run through the basketball community, and uh, it's great to learn more about that. Um, uh, again, a reminder to any of our viewers on today's webinar, if you have questions for Dan that we don't cover, feel free to tweet at us at NABC1927 or use the hashtag NABC Academy and we will pass your question on to Dan. Um, Dan, let's jump right in and start uh, at the Division I men's basketball level. You, you mentioned your work as the primary liaison to the, uh, the NCAA Men's Basketball Committee and uh, it's arguably one of the most recognizable committees in college athletics. So if you could just first explain the role of the committee and, and then maybe more specifically exp explain some of the, the backgrounds uh, of the committee members. Sure, well, uh, I've got the real good fortune and pleasure of working with the basketball committee. It's one of the truly great things I get a chance to do with the NCAA. It's a committee of uh, incredibly distinguished people in our game, a uh, committee of 10 um, that really it looked back historically has been who's who of, of administrators in college athletics. Currently, the chair of the basketball committee is Mark Hollis, the Michigan State Athletic Director, um, who who uh, was a manager for Judd Heathcote and, and Tom Izzo's roommate at, uh, at Michigan State as an undergrad. Deep, deep experience and roots in the game. The vice chair of the committee is Bruce Rasmussen, the athletic director at Creighton University. Has been there for really pretty much his entire career, including a very long and successful stint as a head women's basketball coach at Creighton. Other committee members include Tom Homo, the athletic director at BYU. Um, runs a very successful program at BYU. He's been is in the 11th year as the athletic director at BYU. Peter Roby, the athletic director at Northeastern University, former head basketball coach at Harvard University, and a, and a former uh, basketball player at Dartmouth College a long time ago. Um, other committee members include uh, Bernard Muir, the athletic director at Stanford University, a former basketball player himself at Brown. Uh, Janet Cohn, who's the athletic director at UNC Asheville, and formerly a head women's basketball coach at her alma mater at Samford University. Um, or no, actually, she no, she went to uh, Furman, but coached at Samford uh, for a number of years. And good background there. Um, other committee members include um, the newest members are Paul Krebs, the athletic director at New Mexico, um, and Mitch Barnhart, the athletic director at the University of Kentucky. And other members of the committee include Jim Schaus. The athletic director at Ohio University. It was the distinction, I think, of being the first committee member whose father also served on the committee, Fred Schaus, the former head basketball coach at West Virginia and the Lakers as well. So that's the group that's uh, charged with both selecting, uh, seating, and bracketing the tournament, uh, managing the tournament, uh, selecting sites where the tournament is played from the first four all the way through the final four. And um, they'll meet here um, on a regular basis. They'll meet next week, actually, as part of a selection orientation meeting um, that they do regularly to get ready for selection week, which will take place the first week of March in New York City this year. Well, great. Well, as you mentioned, uh, one of the most prominent roles of the committee is to select and see the tournament field. And we know that's not just something that they do uh, the first week of, of March. So how is the committee starting in November and, and running up through March? How do they evaluate teams in season? Uh, you know, how, how are they judging teams right now? 
Well, you know, that's a great question, Eric, and probably uh, one that maybe fans and media don't fully appreciate, and coaches, you know, quite possibly as well, is, you know, they they work at this selection, seating, and bracketing process all year long. From the very first night of college basketball on November 11th, through the last conference tournament game is played on Selection Sunday weekend. They watch an enormous number of games, um, both mostly on, you know, on TV and video. Uh, they have a direct TV access to every conceivable uh, conference network and, and a broadcast partner that college, covers college basketball, as well as just recently, this is the second year now, we've provided uh, them with access to Synergy, which I know a lot of coaches use for scouting purposes. So literally any game is played anywhere in the country uh, they have access to through Synergy. And um, because of that, they watch an enormous number of games. Um, they also regularly review data, you know, all the analytics that are available in our game. Um, you know, they constantly monitor that. Um, they monitor a player and coach availability. So they're always aware of, you know, what teams are, are at uh, full strength and, and which are down players or indeed a coach in, in unusual circumstances. And they, they are each, uh, each of the 10 committee members, or nine of them actually, all but the chair, are assigned um, a number of conferences to monitor. They're assigned anywhere from three to four conferences as a primary monitor, and then three or four as a secondary monitor. So there will be two committee members assigned to each of the 32 conferences in the country. And it's their responsibility to be really, really experts on that conference. The teams that are in that conference, what kind of year they're having, and while they don't serve as an advocate for those teams or conferences, they do serve as that expert on the, that conference and those teams for the rest of their colleagues on the committee. Um, they have regular calls on a monthly basis with uh, the conference commissioner and his or her designee um, to learn as much as possible about teams, their development, their injuries, uh, their suspensions when players may become eligible mid-semester. Um, so they have full information and even very unusual search circumstances like like a, a team having a very difficult travel situation getting to a game um, or, or something of that nature they bring that human element and that subjectivity of information back to the committee so when teams are evaluated they're evaluated on their full uh, body of work over the course of, of the entire season okay great so that is how they you know how they do their work leading up to like i said selection week which is um uh five full days of work that they do together in person. Um, but it, it's a long process. It starts in November. Sure. Well, that's some great background. And, and you mentioned selection week in March. If you could, uh, uh, obviously this, you could talk about this for hours, but give us the cliff notes version of what that week look like, looks like and, and how a team is ultimately, uh, you know, selected for the tournament. And here's their name called on selection Sunday. Sure. Well, it really starts with um, the, uh, the very first meeting they have on Wednesday of that week, they come in on Tuesday night and they'll meet on Wednesday and they'll submit their initial ballot. This is one of the very first things that they do. And essentially they've at that point done all of their homework, all those games they've watched, all the evaluation, conference monitoring calls. They'll come in with a list of somewhere in the ballpark of generally speaking 20 or so teams that they feel like are under any circumstance, whether they win their automatic bid or not, are teams that should be in the field as one of the 36 at-large teams. Um, some of those teams will have already possibly played in and won their conference championship, those teams that play in tournaments earlier than, than when the committee first meets. Um, they can select no more than 36 of those teams. And uh, when a team gets all but two qualifying votes from the committee as being at-large teams, they're put into the field. That, those are the first teams that are actually put into the field um, somewhere, like I said, in the ballpark of, you know, 20 to 25 teams will be selected right away the very first day of the meeting in that regard. Some of those teams will then move on to be their automatic qualifiers and, and move from the at-large pool over to the AQ pool, and, um, and that will open up spots for other teams to be considered throughout the rest of the week. But um, much of their work goes into, you know, that first initial ballot even before they get to New York City. And then the deliberations and the hard work really begins of trying to select teams above that that first initial ballot, um, all the way up to the 36 at-large teams that are, that are chosen and selected. Okay, <clears throat> great. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there's uh, oftentimes some misunderstanding about 
the process from the perspective of fans, from the media, and and even coaches. I think if they were being honest. So, what what are some of those common misperceptions that that you know, if there were a few things that you would like to address and perhaps set the record straight on about the uh, the selection process. Well, I, I mean, from there, there's really three parts to the process, as, as you know. There's, there's the selecting of the 36 best at-large teams because the field of 68 is broken down to 36 at-large teams and the 32 automatic qualifiers from the 32 conferences. The committee has no role at all in, in who those teams are that win their automatic qualifier in those 32 league tournaments. Uh, they do play a obviously a, an essential role in cho choosing the 36 uh, remaining uh, best at-large teams to fill out the field, and then they seed all 68 of those teams and then place them into the into the bracket. Um, I think that uh, you know I would start by saying from a selection standpoint. Their goal is to pick the 36 best teams to be at-large invitations. Their goal is not to pick the most deserving of the 36 teams in the country, but those teams that have gone out and won quality games and through their results proven that they are, in the committee's estimation, the 36 best teams to be included in the field. And, and really, that, that's something they keep first and foremost in their deliberations at all times. Okay, great. Um, uh, moving ahead past the selection process and looking at the NCAA tournament and the upcoming Final Four, uh, obviously the, the Final Four in the NABC convention are headed to Phoenix in April for the first time ever. What can NABC members who are planning on attending expect from Phoenix as a host city? Well, we, we couldn't be more excited about going to Phoenix. Um, it's the first time in 22 years that the Final Four will be played on the West Coast, not since 1995 when Seattle hosted the Final Four, has the Final Four been west of St. Louis. And so this is uh, an opportunity to celebrate basketball in the West, um, to go to an area that it has tremendous experience in hosting big time events. Just in the last two years, the Phoenix Valley of the Sun area has hosted the Super Bowl as well as the College Football National Championship. Um, so we're excited to bring basketball to Phoenix and um, think that uh, the NABC convention uh, attendees will have a tremendous experience, kind of like a spring break-like experience um, in a beautiful part of the world in early April where it's uh, almost guaranteed to be uh, sunny and in the 80s or 90s and uh, plenty of golf and pools and uh, a tremendous experience outside of the games and the convention, which is what all of us are going to be there for first and foremost. And uh, so we're excited. They're doing a great job of planning. And um, we've had a really positive res response from the membership about being in Phoenix. That's great. I think we're all excited uh, to be in Phoenix for the first time and to be back on the West Coast for the Final Four. Uh, a couple uh, Before we move on, a couple of Twitter questions that have come in, Dan. Uh, the first um, is just asking if the NCA or the committee uh, – ever has any discussions about extending the Division One championship field beyond the current 68 teams? Yeah, you know, in my four plus years now at the NCA, that really has not been a, a topic of discussion at all with the basketball committee. Um, uh, my sense is that uh, both the current committee and those committee members that have served uh, previously to this year feel like 68 is, is the right number. Um, you know, while there may be some other deserving teams, certainly every year for consideration to be invited, that um, we're not far off the number that's appropriate. And uh, we don't get any requests, frankly, from our television partners for, for more teams or more games in the tournament. And so it really hasn't been at all a topic of conversation, you know, like I said, in the last few years. And then uh, another Twitter question on the topic of the Final Four. Um, when you're looking at future site potentials uh, for the Final Four, how has, has that you know, list of criteria evolved over the years as cities and facilities have evolved? Well, it's evolved quite a bit. Um, you know, since 2009, the, the Final Four uh, is played in a larger venue um, in a court configuration that puts the court right in the middle of a football stadium. So the minimum seating capacity now for a Final Four is 60,000, which means that there's really only uh, about 10 cities currently in the United States that, that have a facility that's large enough to host the Final Four, that also have the 10,000 or so uh, full-service hotel rooms 
in close proximity to the venue that are required uh, for hosting the Final Four and, and then, uh, you know, uh, attractive and regular air service to that city as well. So it's a select few number of places that we can consider to go. And uh, I think it, it just speaks to the very popular nature of the event. Um, it's grown an awful lot. Just last week, I was um, in Salt Lake City to see a game uh, at the Huntsman Center at the, on the University of Utah, Utah campus, Oregon, Utah played. And I was there for my first Final Four in 1979, the, the year that Magic and Bird faced off in the cha championship game. And I couldn't help but think of how far the tournament has come since 1979. Awesome facility, a great atmosphere at the Huntsman Center, but um, it's we, the Final Four is played in a much larger venue now. Indeed. If you're just joining us, uh, once again, welcome to the first ever NABC Academy web webinar. We're speaking with NCAA Vice President of Basketball, Dan Gavitt. Uh, if you have any questions for Dan at all during our, our webinar, please feel free to tweet them to us. You can send them to at NABC1927, or you can use the hashtag uh, NABC Academy. Um, Dan, moving on now, we, we just talked about the, the Division One level. Uh, you also oversee the Division Two and Division Three championships. So kind of similar questions to above. Um, uh, if you can explain, you know, the the makeup, the role of the committees at the D2 and D3 level and how they might differ a little bit from the Division One level. Sure. Um, the Division Two, I'll start with the Division Two championship first, I guess. Um, both the Division Two and Division Three championships are similar in size, and yet the tournaments are probably more regionalized in many ways than the Division One tournament is. Um, the Division II tournament is a 64-team field as well. Um, the, the, it's, it has, it's, it's selected by a, a committee of eight that's chaired currently by Jeff Wilson, who's the head basketball coach at East Stroudsburg State uh, University. And um, it's, the, the tournament is set up in, in eight different regions where eight different teams in each of those eight regions uh, compete in a, in a bracket where one plays eight, and two plays seven, three plays six, and four plays five. And, You've got eight winners out of those um, eight regions that advance to the elite eight, uh, and and then uh, on you know to the national championship game. The uh, this year's uh, field will be selected and announced on March 5th at 10:30 p.m. on NCA.com, and the term will wrap up in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, at the Sanford Pentagon, where the elite eight will be played, and the national champion will be determined on March 25th. Um, you know, criteria for selection to the Division II championship is um, is similar to the Division I championship in many ways, but um, they both the Division II and Division III championship uh, committees use uh, regional advisory committees very significantly. The Division I championship does as well, but I think given the um, the nature of all the games that are available on television at the Division I level. Um, you know, while the NABC Regional Advisory Committee is important at some level to the committee, I think at the Division Two and Three level, it's it's even more so. The regional nature of those tournaments. So, um, each of the committee members serves as a chair of a regional advisory committee uh, that has members that coach and administrate in that region and gets to know those teams very well. They um, they have uh, kind of weekly ranking calls. Um, the first of which uh, will take place soon for Division Two. They release those rankings on a weekly basis. Uh, the first release for, by Division Two will be on February 15th, and again on February 22nd and March 1st. In each of those eight regions, they'll they'll uh, rank the the top eight as of that point in the season, and they use the following criteria: in region winning percentage, Division Two winning percentage, Division Two strength of schedule, Division Two head to head competition and results against Division II common opponents, as well as the RPI and uh, other performance indicators. Um, and that's how that's how the field is evaluated and ultimately chosen. Great. So like you said, with Division One, is it safe to say that it's exactly the same on the D2 and D3 level, that the committee's goal is to select the best available at-large teams uh, for the field? Yeah, that's, that is the goal. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, somewhat different at the Division Two level in Division One and Three is um, Division One and Three have automatic qualifiers, automatic champions that uh, that become part of the field, and um, that's not the case at the Division Two level. Um, but uh, the field is is selected in in the manner that I mentioned. So, okay, in great. The Division Division Three level, you've got um, a similar process, um, a 64 team field. 
The chair of the eight-member selection committee is Kevin Vandestreek, the head coach at Calvin College. Uh, their selection bracket announcement will be on Monday, February 27th at 12.30 p.m. on NCA.com. And their championship, uh, as it's been held for the last many years, will be again in Salem, Virginia at the Salem Civic Center. And the championship game played on Saturday, March 18th on CBS Sports Network at, um, at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, many of the same criteria or similar criteria are used. So you've got uh, in Division Three, they consider uh, three different pools uh, from which to choose the teams. Pool A are the conference champions, the automatic qualifiers that, that uh, qualify for the tournament that way. Pool B are independent institutions as well as those conferences that don't have an automatic qualifier. And then Pool C would be your, considered your kind of at-large selections. And, um, Similar to Division II, win-loss percentage against Division III schools, particularly in their region, um, the strength of schedule, head-to-head -head competition, results against common opponents in Division III level, um, and results against ranked teams at Division III level are the primary criteria used to select that field. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for the background on Division II and Division III. Uh, once again, a reminder that if you have any questions for Dan that we're not covering, feel free to send us a tweet at NABC1927, or you can use the hashtag uh, NABC Academy. Um, Dan, if we can now, let's focus a little bit more on just kind of overall basketball policy and governance at the NCAA. In the last couple of years, there's been a, a two new committees introduced at the NCAA, the, uh, the Men's Basketball Oversight Committee and now the Men's Basketball Competition Committee. Uh, if you could explain just what the, the role is of both of those committees and what uh, they hope to accomplish. Sure. Uh, the, the Men's Basketball Oversight Committee is uh, now, I guess, in its second year uh, as part of the new governance reform that the NCA underwent. That group uh, reports to the NCA Division I Council. Um, it is a Division I focused group. Um, it doesn't have any role in the Division II or Division III governance. Um, it's, uh, it's been uh, meant to, to centralize the management of all things Division I men's basketball. It actually oversees the Division I men's basketball committee, the tournament selection committee. Uh, that committee reports to the oversight committee now. Um, the playing rules committee does as well, officiating, uh, legislation, and now the newly established competition committee that you mentioned that I'll speak of in a moment. The oversight committee has been led by uh, athletic director at UCLA, Dan Guerrero. Um, and includes athletic directors, commissioners, two head coaches. Uh, we're lucky to have both Bill Self and Ron Hunter, and ABC board members to serve on the oversight committee. Two student athletes, uh, Nick Venetta from UNC Asheville and Kadeem Latin from Oklahoma, as well as Jim Haney, uh, serves on that oversight committee as well, representing the ABC. I work uh, with the oversight committee along with my colleague, Sharnell Kemper from AMA, as the primary liaisons. They meet about four times a year in person. And it's a great group that's really doing some outstanding work for men's basketball. Um, some of the early success that committee has had is uh, last year, uh, the change in the, the NBA pre-draft process uh, that gives student athletes now more time to make their decision as to whether they stay in school or, or explore their, their dreams in, at the NBA level and can compete at um, in the combine now uh, with the NBA, um, as well as the, the formation of a competition committee, uh, work on the time demands issue. Um, that group is really doing great work for college basketball. One of the things that they established, as you mentioned, is this competition committee, which has not met yet for the first time, but will by phone soon and then again at the Final Four. It's again a Division I focused committee, modeled really after the NBA and NFL competition committees populated by experts in the game, former coaches and players, current coaches and administrators, a current player, and three members from the outside um, that do not currently uh, represent a, an institution or, or a conference. Um, the committee is going to have regular communication with the playing rules committee and will review student athlete health, health and safety issues, sportsmanship and integrity issues, game operations and presentation, technology, and statistical trends, and it will develop strategic principles in these areas and then advise the Men's Basketball Oversight Committee. Um, they really will focus on strategies to maintain the popularity and relevance of the sport and keep the game playable for players and watchable for fans. 
And the group is populated by the fo following people. We've got, uh, there's a 10 member committee. Um, there are two liaisons from the oversight committee that will work with that group. Paul Brazo, senior associate commissioner at the ACC and Judy Rose, the athletic director at UNC Charlotte. And the 10 members of the committee that were just appointed include um, Bob McKillop from Davidson College and uh, Ernie Kent from Washington State, those being the two coach representatives. Ernie also a member of the NABC board. Um, the student athlete is um, uh, Nicholas Norton at, from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And then we have four current administrators. Uh, Jim Delaney, the commissioner of the Big, East, uh, Big Ten Conference, will be the chair of that group. Uh, Dan Leibovitz, senior associate commissioner at the Southeast Conference. Uh, Chris Reynolds, the athletic director at Bradley University, and Stu Jackson, associate commissioner at the Big East Conference. The three outside uh, appointees um, that names that everyone will recognize certainly include Jay Billis from ESPN, Clark Kellogg from CBS, and Kiki Vandeway, who is now the senior vice president of basketball operations at the NBA. So it's a really good and powerful group that will have a lot of influence in the game. That's great. I think we're all excited to see uh, what these two committees produce and what kind of impact they can make at the NCAA. Uh, you mentioned coach involvement, NABC board member and other coaches uh, involved on both of their, those committees. Um, how else in your time at the NCAA and currently have you seen NABC member coaches uh, impacting basketball policy and, uh, and just, you know, the overall state of the game there at the NCAA? Incredibly deeply, Eric, uh, and I think it's important for you know for those that are that are tuning in, members in ABC, to know what kind of influence coaches have on our game. Um, first of all, like I mentioned, Jim Haney, the executive director, and I talk on a weekly basis. Um, we have a standing call, we have a deep relationship, and 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 talk on a regular basis. Of course, your entire staff, Reggie Mitten and others, you know, work very closely with with our staff at the NCA on the convention and other things. And the involvement of NABC board members and members of the NABC on committees for the NCA that, that, that oversee and manage the game are critical. Um, you know, uh, and it goes both ways. Uh, Jim Haney has asked that I, along with Kevin Lennon, who's uh, head of Division I governance at the NCA, uh, serve as ex officio members of the NABC board. So we attend every meeting and take, uh, participate in every call that takes place. Dan Guerrero, the chair of the Basketball Oversight Committee, also serves as a member of the NABC board. Um, and then conversely, as I mentioned, both Bill Self and Ron Hunter, members of the NABC board, currently serve on the Men's Basketball Oversight Committee, along with Jim Haney. We've got uh, representatives from the NABC on the Playing Rules Committee, certainly now on the uh, Competition Committee, and Bob McKillop and Ernie Kent. So the relationship is really critical. Um, and, and really does have a, a major impact on how the game is, is managed, on how the rules are formed, on how officiating is, um, you know, is done on behalf of the game, coaches and student athletes. And uh, I, I just can't imagine not having the kind of relationship we have for the benefit of the game. You know, I see the, the, the backdrop behind you that very clearly you know, states uh, as part of the mission of the NABC as guardians of the game, and, and we, we uh, treasure that as well at the NCA and, and uh, appreciate the time and effort that ABC board members give to, to the game, not just the Division I level, which is where my comments were most recently, but also Division II and three, uh, and ABC members serving on playing rules committees and uh, sport committees like the, the championship committees and the like um, is critical for the game. Well, Dan, that, that's great background, and I think I can speak on behalf of our members and staff to, to thank you for the way the NCA has uh, included the voice of the coaches uh, in the governance of college basketball. Um, before we wrap up here today, Dan, is there anything else that, that you think from your seat there in Indianapolis would, uh, that you'd like to bring to the attention of our coaches or think would be uh, some good information to have in the hands of our members? Yeah, you know, along the lines you just meant, you know, asked about the participation of Bob and the coaches, you mentioned earlier, I think, the, the, the ad hoc groups that the NABC's put together. You know, just in the last two years, there's been two ad hoc groups that Jim Haney and Reggie Minden have put together that really have impacted the game in a very positive way. One is a, a group that formed about a year ago to make suggestions to the Division I Men's Basketball Committee on 
those selection seating and bracketing process. Um, that work and that collaboration is ongoing, but already um, there's been some, some changes uh, at the rec recommendation and suggestion of that group, one of which is that the overall number one seed in the Division I tournament will now have preference as to where they go for the first and second round at regionals. And another is we just announced last week that uh, next weekend, uh, Saturday, February 11th at 1230 on CBS, the basketball committee will for the first time release uh, mid-season ranking, the top 16 teams, if the tournament were, were to start at that time and put those top 16 into a bracket as they would uh, on Selection Sunday, um, or what the regional bracket might look like. And um, that was a suggestion by the NABC that I think ultimately uh, convinced the basketball committee it was a th good thing to do for the tournament. I think it uh, will provide some education and open, openness and transparency to the process and, um, and uh, as well as create some buzz, you know, a month before the tournament and Selection Sunday as to what the basketball committee is thinking. So, um, you know, it's things like that and, and time demands, another group that, that worked on um, an ad hoc basis for the NABC that is really making a positive impact on our game. And um, we appreciate the, the partnership and collaboration um, from coaches and their passion and love of the game as we do uh, and as a, as a membership does and look forward to continuing that great work for the college basketball game. Dan, I, I think it's safe to say that the feeling's mutual from our end and from our coaches' end. And uh, Dan, we can't thank you enough for joining us today, for being the first ever guest here on the NABC Academy webinar series. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Well, the, you, you can only go up from here, Eric. Uh, I appreciate being the first, but I know there are a lot of guests out there that will knock it out of the park uh, even more than I. So I, I think it's a great idea. It's a great thing for the game, for coaches, for education. And uh, so if you ever want to have me back on again sometime in the future, I'm happy to do it. And uh, best of luck with the series. Well, thanks, Dan. I'm sure we'll take you up on that. Uh, if anyone joined our webinar in progress today and would like to see the full version, it'll be available right away on our YouTube page or also on uh, nabc.com. And again, just a reminder to our viewers, uh, if you have suggestions on who you'd like to see in the future, please tweet at us, reach out to us, uh, let us know how we can serve you, our members. And again, thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you all in Phoenix at the NABC convention and the final four in just a couple months. Take care, everyone.